Hi again then guys, and welcome to a review which I hadn't initially planned to do for Gran Turismo Sport, because as many of you guys know, I don't revisit cars that often. Once I've reviewed it once, on whichever the newest game in the franchise is, that's where I tend to leave it. Because although specifics can sometimes change, the essence of how the car performs, which is usually what I talk about, doesn't really change that much. The car remains what it is, and that's what I tend to talk about. However, there are some occasions where a car is popular enough, or at least has enough interest associated with it, that it could warrant another look. And in the case of this car, I would say that that is present. That, along with the fact that I have had some specific requests to take another look at this car. And I must admit, when you combine the fact that I do love the car, I'm not going to pretend that I don't, that makes me more inclined to revisit it, but more significantly than that even, you can now upgrade this car. And that is such a huge difference to have, because alongside the TS30 from Toyota, these are both now upgradable prototypes in GT Sport, whereas on GT6, they were not. You could tune certain aspects, but you could not upgrade them whereas now you can. Now for the Toyota, that wasn't really a problem. In fact, it's one of the most OP race cars on GT6. For the Nismo, on the other hand, to me, it always felt like it wasn't delivering on its full potential. And that's not necessarily unrealistic, because in real life, it wasn't quick enough either, partially because it didn't have the hybrid system which Nissan wanted it to. As I've discussed recently on the channel, in the Forza 7 review of this car, it had no way near the hybrid power that it was supposed to, and that really hindered it. Because straight up, I will say about this car, as much as I love it, it's not a cornering machine. Even when you drive this car perfectly, it can easily be outmaneuvered by any rear-wheel drive prototype, even something from the LMP2 or even an LMP3 class if that were in the game. It can easily be outdone, for instance on a hairpin corner or through city streets, no contest. But that's never been this car's strong point. The strong point is always sheer straight line speed, and in particular, mid-range acceleration. This car is straight up the fastest real prototype on GT Sport. The R18, the TS30, the TS40, even the mighty Porsche 919 don't even come close. As you can see around this track, which, let's face it, this isn't the best of tracks for top speed, but even here, you can easily get this car up around 225 miles per hour. Now, this is a fully upgraded model, and that is where the difference really comes in, because this car has 604 horsepower stock, 691 pound-feet of torque, so basically the same numbers that it had on GT6 with 880 kilos, and almost 700 horsepower per tonne. Now, however, thanks to Gran Turismo Sport, this car can be tuned to well over 900 horsepower, and that means that in a straight line, this car is a thing of beauty. Watch this video and look at that speedo. The acceleration is crazy on any of the straight sections. In fact, it can give the vast majority of Vision GT cars a great run for their money. It's that fast. So anyone who just blanketly says that the Nismo is a waste of time is categorically wrong. You just don't know how to use this car correctly. Because even though I love it, and it is brilliant in what it's good at, I'm not going to say it's great in every way. There are certain ways where it's specifically not great. I said even before this car ran in the Le Mans, and failed miserably, that it was an inherently flawed concept, because as brilliant as it ever could be, you're always going to have the problem that it's a front-wheel drive car, and no matter how well engineered it is, you can't put that kind of power and torque through a front-wheel drive car and expect it to handle or perform or even have the race results of a rear-wheel drive car. It's just not going to work that way. Now, of course, Nissan and Nismo didn't expect it to, that was the whole point of the crazy powerful hybrid, and the fact that it couldn't have that in the actual race, that it wasn't ready, really neutered what the car could have done, because cornering was never where this car was going to dominate, and that's how it applies in the game as well. If you get this car on a straight section, nothing comes close. Through the corners, it's one of the slowest. Now, with that as a point of reference, one of my laps in this video is roughly a 135.8, I think it was. It's a 135 something, uh, might be 0.7 or 0.8. That's 
two seconds quicker than my fully upgraded Porsche 919. Let that sink in. That Porsche is not a slow car, and that lap was from the rivals match that I did between the Porsche and the Toyota. I was pushing both of those cars pretty hard, to say the least. Now, I'm not the fastest of drivers, but still, given that it's me driving all of the cars, it's still a pretty good point of reference. And driving all of them, and pushing all of them hard, two seconds faster is a big deal. Now, of course, this car has so much more power, but even the Porsche, with its hybrid system out of corners in particular, is running around 900 horses, if not more. Not all the time, of course, but for at least a portion of the time. And I did not expect this car to be faster. The fact that it is, is pretty awesome. And it just goes to show the innate potential, which it does have. Now, the real key to driving the Nismo has never changed. It's the same on GT6, Forza 6, Forza 7, GT Sport, any game that features this car, you should always drive it in the same way. And this is what I mean about physics not really changing that much, even if a game does. When you approach driving this car, I would recommend embracing the concept of coasting. There is nothing wrong with letting a race car coast through a corner for a couple of seconds without giving it any throttle. It can feel like an eternity of going slow, but it really isn't, especially in a car like this. You never need to give it that much throttle through a corner, because it's just going to work against you. So, the way I'd recommend driving this car on any track is to let it coast into the corner, of course after braking. Then, when you're around halfway through the corner, start to give it a little bit of throttle, maybe up to around half, about 50% throttle. And then, once you get up out of second gear, up into third, dependent of course on your ratios, then you can give it the beans. And as a general rule, only fully accelerate when the car is pretty much pointing in the exact direction that you want it to go. Because it's kind of like a wind-up car, in that sense. When you pull it back, you want to make sure it's going to fire in the direction that you want it. As long as you keep that in mind, this car can be an absolute weapon. And I love it for that. This car is bonkers fast in a straight line, and around corners, it's not bad, it's just so radically different that the vast majority of people don't see the need of why they should stick to it and try to learn how to use it. It's a car which isn't altogether necessary, but if you do put the time into mastering it, it will serve you so well. And that's why I love it as well. I did take the time to do that on both Forza and GT6, and having done so, it's now faster than all of my other prototypes, as these lap times go to show. Now, will it be the fastest on every track? No, categorically not, especially on a super small, super tight circuit, like a city track, for instance. It won't be, but any track which allows you to use even a fraction of that straight line ability, that is where this car will shine. So overall, if you tried this car, but not tried it on GT Sport, I urge you to give it a second chance, because for a million credits, it is a truly brilliant, but flawed concept. Overall then, that's it for this particular pick. I'll see you guys next time, and as always, thanks for watching.